you know, transitional justice in Ukraine uh, with Dmitry Koval, Dmitro Koval, who joins us from Kiev right now today here on Think Tech. Welcome to the show, uh, Dmitro. Thank you, Jay. My pleasure to be here. Well, um, you know, you're right in the middle of it, or at least in the, 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 north, the northeast middle of it. And um, I, I would like to talk to you about all the various factors that point to the future and, um, you know, get your opinions and perspectives on what is happening and what will happen. Um, so there are some things that are, that are clearly optimistic. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Volodymyr uh, Zelensky has to get points. He's been a very good strategist, um, and he keeps on doing the right thing. And uh, you got to give him credit um, for getting as far as he has, defending Ukraine, and in fact, advancing back on the Russians. Uh, what do people think about his strategical capabilities? Uh, it's hard to say uh, just like that, uh, what they think about his uh, strategical um, capabilities, because uh, I, I would say that there are two pictures of Zelensky, at least uh, two for now. Uh, the one is the President Zelensky, the president during the peacetime, and uh, probably um, many considered him uh, as not the, the best president or president with his own flaws. But uh, there is also this picture of Zelensky during the wartime. And this picture for many is very positive since he was able to hold for so long against Russian army. And now he um, he is uh, basically moderating and uh, he is um, the one who uh, uh, leads uh, the counteroffensive against uh, the Russian forces. And also uh, he represents Ukraine on the international arena uh, really brightly. You see all those um, speeches in different parliaments. You see how he energizes the West and the whole international community to support Ukraine, but not only to support Ukraine, but also to support a democracy, support human rights, and uh, uh, act against uh, aggression and uh, totalitarianism. So that's uh, definitely impressive. And uh, for this, uh, he receives his... Uh, uh, positive feedbacks, not only from Ukrainians, but, but also from Europeans and Americans and many other nations. You know, um, he has been successful in, in bringing the EU together behind him and uh, um, bringing the US be, behind him and, uh, you know, uh, sort of galvanizing NATO um, behind him. But, you know, we live in a world of change, Dimitro. Everything changes. It seems to me that Things change more quickly now. Uh, we're not used to all the, you know, the, the changes and, and the rap rapidity of the changes. And so you have, um, you know, changes among the countries in the EU. Um, you have issues, uh, for example, in France with Marine Le Pen uh, and her, her friends. Um, and now you have a very strange election in Italy, which uh, really should have learned its lesson in World War II, but didn't. Um, and now it's moving to the right, to a more, uh, uh, a more fascist approach. And, um, and uh, although uh, she seems to have changed her tune through the course of her campaign, um, Georgia Maloney uh, seems to be kind of on the right side of things and, and um, um, tending toward autocracy and, if you will, fascism. Um, and this is not good because she she has made statements that uh, she she's trying to take them back now, walk them back, but she has made statements that indicate she wants to pull um, pull her support uh, from the EU, from NATO, and from Ukraine. Uh, so those two countries and their significant countries uh, seem to me to be problematic and stand in the way of optimism about EU and and NATO. What do you think? I would not pretend that uh, I am an expert in international relations and uh, politics in France and Italy, but from my standpoint, um, it's too early probably to call uh, those election a uh, defeat of Europe or uh, the huge issue for the security in Europe. 
First of all, in France, Le Pen lost her elections and it was not the first election that she lost. It was the second election, basically, that she lost to Macron. And there were more that she lost to other political forces, political parties and uh, figures. So um, it's uh, um, a big issue whether she survives uh, this loss or uh, and actually uh, continues uh, um, yeah, as a, one of the leading politicians in France. So we'll see what happens with her. But for now, uh, there is, uh, I would say, centrist uh, coalition in the French parliament. There is a president who also um, tries to portray himself as a centrist. And uh, we have, I, I believe, quite strong support uh, of France. Um, and when it comes to, to Italy, you very rightly uh, noticed that uh, the um, uh, winner of these elections uh, changed uh, her tone uh, throughout the election. And now she sounds more like uh, not ultra right, but just right, which is, of course, better than, than it was before. Uh, moreover, uh, Italy, um, in Italy, we see quite a dramatic change in their attitudes towards Ukraine and Russia. One of the things that I uh, should mention here probably is that uh, three uh, regions of Italy formally recognized um, Crimea as part of Russia. So they, uh, contrary to the Italian position, they said that uh, Russia leg uh, legally um, occupied or legally um, attached Crimea to its territory. But now, after February 24, they changed their position. So this dramatic change um, shows us that even those who uh, earlier sympathized uh, to Putin, they are now uh, more... Um, they, they, uh, the, the, the war opened their eyes, I would say, and uh, they now see much clearer than they saw before. So maybe uh, this uh, change to uh, to to the right in italian politics would not mean as much as we now think that it might mean i mean we'll see again we'll see um in germany i i admire germany i certainly admired it while while uh, angela merkel was there um and i admire their you know their leadership if you will the part of ukraine and in dealing with the migrants that was a very tough issue for them um but uh, it's 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 going to get cold, Dimitro. It's going to get cold, and um, there's energy problems and heat problems in Germany and other countries in in Western Europe. And um, do you think that that affects the calculus here? Uh, will that affect how the EU, um, you know, sees this issue uh, when they start getting cold and they don't have enough energy? First of all, I would not say that uh, Germany was leading European efforts uh, uh, or, or, or of the support to, towards Ukraine. Um, I don't want to sound ungrateful. Definitely, Germany did a lot for um, supporting Ukraine, both in terms of financial support, in terms of hosting our um, uh, people who left, uh, who fled the war. Uh, and uh, also uh, providing some materials, uh, some weapons, et cetera. But at the same time, uh, there are lots of issues that are unresolved uh, in terms of our relations with Germany, for instance. We, uh, are, we are asking for some uh, machines, uh, some vehicle, military vehicles that we are not receiving for quite some time. There are also some misunderstandings with regards to energy, um, security of Europe, uh, Ukraine insisted that this uh, uh, North Stream 2 is a bad idea. It insisted uh, on, on uh, for quite some time on, on this, but uh, uh, we were not heard uh, in Berlin. So th there are quite uh, quite a few issues uh, that uh, uh, does that don't allow me to say that Germany is leading the efforts of the European Union. I would mm -hmm. say that rather Baltic states or Poland. Uh, are leading uh, those efforts. Uh, but uh, uh, speaking about uh, this winter, uh, from what we are hearing from Scholz and other European politicians, Euro Europe prepared itself to cold winter. So in some countries, uh, the use of natural gas from Russia 
dropped 50% by now. That's a really dramatic, um, dramatic decrease. And in other countries, there are strategies in place on how to deal with the situation that, that Europe will face this winter. So there are some contracts with Qatar, with um, United Arab Emirates. Uh, there is increase of uh, gas supply from Norway and uh, United States. Hopefully, this will help to survive this winter. Not, of course, develop uh, as it was last year. Not. Uh, um have the same level of comfort as it was before but still uh in terms of survival in terms of uh, some uh, basic needs they will be covered that's for sure how um tony blinken was uh, talking about you know international relations a couple of days ago uh, on sunday um and uh on 60 minutes if you ever watch 60 minutes on cbs american cbs um but um I'm not I'm not sure that I get that he is doing and that Joe Biden is doing what we would have expected in terms of getting the funding, getting the weapons onto Ukraine. Uh, how do people feel about uh, their follow through on those assurances? Um, the mood changes uh, all the time. During the first two weeks of the war, there was this expectation, probably unreasonable. Uh, that uh, United States will uh, support Ukraine in uh, all possible ways, uh, including boots on the ground. But uh, uh, realistically, many uh, didn't expect it, this to happen because uh, that would provoke even more aggression, as some say, from the Russian side, and that would may maybe even uh, end up in the Third World War. But um, uh, this being said, uh, the support that we are receiving from the United States is indeed huge, and people in Ukraine appreciate that a lot. Uh, they noted that, that they know about this, they know about the financial support, they know about military support, political support. So uh, I would say that right now uh, the consensus is that the United States is doing its best. Of course, uh, with some weapons, with some systems, with some um, missiles, we would uh, like to, to have them faster. But uh, apart from the political uh, side of, of these uh, decisions uh, concerning the supply of missiles, for instance, there is also a logistical issue. Sometimes uh, we underestimate the logistical, logistical uh, difficulty that uh, any uh, army any side would face in delivering heavy machinery, heavy weapons from one continent to another. So I believe that uh, um, on the balance, United States is doing pretty, pretty well. We want that to continue, if not increase. But um, looking at Putin, we always need to look at Putin because he's a psychopath. I mean that in the nicest possible way. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, first thing is uh, he seems to be losing the support of the Russian people. Um, the, uh, the draft isn't working well. It's not organized. It's, uh, it's an administrative fiasco. Um, and uh, a lot of young, young men are opposing it and taking steps against it and leaving the country uh, as they have been doing for since the war began. Um, there are the protests and the protests uh, that's, that, were, that existed at the beginning of the war look small now uh, because the protests are much, much more uh, widespread in Russia over that, and, uh, outside of Moscow, for example. And um, <clears throat> Putin, you know, there have been calls in the Western media for Putin to step down. In fact, reporting that there are those in Russia who would like to see him step down, that he's done. He's, he's, he's put a big bet on this adventure in Ukraine. Um, and he's lost it already. Um, of course, um, you know, that, that may not be exactly uh, consistent with the reality, but I wonder what your thoughts are. Just how, how do people see, people in Ukraine and for that matter in Russia, how do they see Putin and Putin's future as the leader of, of Russia? You know, that the territory where uh, I can easily fall into wishful thinking, so I will try my best not to do that. 
Uh, first of all, uh, of course, Putin experiences uh, some troubles in drafting, uh, some troubles in uh, supplying the newly drafted with uh, um, weapons, even with uh, um, some uh, basic uh, weapons or like bulletproof jackets or uh, Kalashnikovs uh, or something like that. So th there are problems even with these basic stuff. But uh, I can't say right now that uh, he will face even larger uh, protests from Russian people and that uh, that would result in uh, him resigning. Um, it's uh, really too, too early to call. It's hard to predict what will happen next. But I just want to, um, uh, to uh, highlight one uh, tendency here. Um, we should not try to think about those who are living in Russia right now as the supporters of democracy or as the opposition to Putin. Many of those who are living right now, they are not in opposition to Putin. They are not against this, as they call it, special military operation. They are living because they do not want to be killed. That's the explanation for many. I do, do not say that that explains this motive explains the behavior of all those Russians who are living right now at the territory of their country. But we are, uh, what we are seeing in uh, different charts, Telegram channels, um, Facebook groups, etc. Uh, many Russians who are living, they say, they ask uh, questions like, should we put a Z symbol uh, on our cars or it's better to um, get it uh, from our, get it away from our car? Or uh, sh sh what, what should we say to uh, the border police? Should we say that we support Russian forces or we should rather keep quiet on that? So there are all, the, so, all sorts of these discussions uh, between the Russians themselves, those Russians who are uh, waiting on, on the queue to leave Russia. So, um, my point is that uh, we should not uh, uh, say that uh, uh, Russians who are leaving, they are in the opposition and that they will not return and uh, uh, gladly embrace Russia after the end of the armed conflict, uh, which we are having now on the territory of Ukraine. Um, but um, uh, anyway, um, the uh, brain drop that uh, we are seeing in Russia will definitely uh, have its uh, impact on the Russian economy and uh, the potential uh, of Russian development. But uh, for Putin, it's more about, uh, right now, it's more about a more, um, let's say, um, short-term go goals. Uh, he's not thinking about the decade uh, or two decades from now. He's thinking about a really very, um, uh, short-term result that he wants to achieve, uh, for instance, to stop Ukrainian counteroffensive or uh, to uh, conquer the rest of Donetsk region, which is still under Ukrainian control because almost 50% of the territory of Donetsk region is under Ukrainian control, even now, after he proclaimed that it's the primary goal of his military operation. So uh, for, for these causes, he may uh, mobilize every uh, portion of resources that he possesses, and uh, he can, uh, because of that, he can just ignore the long-term consequences for the economy or for the country that this uh, brain growth uh, and this uh, migration from Russia causes. What about these um, elections, these sham elections that he set up in Donbass? Um, uh, uh, is anybody respecting them? Are people voting? Uh, how are they voting? Uh, we see a lot of videos from the occupied territories uh, showing that uh, usually uh, the members of either uh, occupation forces or members, some collaborants from Ukrainian side, uh, those who decided willingly to cooperate with Russia, because of course, as in any other situation, there are those who, who uh, either think alike with Russians or uh, accepted some benefit that Russians uh, propose. 
so we are seeing that those people uh, are going around cities and they see just silence so they they can't uh, reach to anyone on the occupied territory and to persuade them to to vote it's actually not a voting it's a referendum so it's uh, the uh, quasi uh, uh poll uh, on whether those region uh, want to join russia but definitely it's not about uh, people voting it's just about creating the picture for um own audience or the internal audience of russian russians and uh, for maybe some foreigners that would later um support a russian position uh there is no credibility uh, of any kind uh, behind this election so it, it's not about credibility it's not about legitimacy it's rather about just a tv picture that will be shown for some uh, world politicians and primarily uh, for Russians themselves, just to uh, show that uh, Russia uh, is facing this huge popular support on Ukrainian territory. So that that is it. Uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, um, uh, a real referendum. It's just just a mock uh, referendum that Russia organizes. You know. Um... Over over the last few weeks, uh, with um, you know Putin's various uh, strategic failures uh, in eastern Ukraine and his failure to advance into western Ukraine, um, and uh, a combination of the very brutal things that he's done, and I want to talk about that separately, uh, he seems to have uh, lost um, uh, any remaining influence, any any remaining support from a lot of people who were supporting him. I mean, it was really, uh, it was really quiet at the United Nations. And in fact, the Russian ambassador left. Um, uh, or was it the Russian foreign secretary or whoever it was? He left um, immediately after his remarks and his remarks didn't get much of a reception. Um, likewise, uh, Xi Jinping is um, not particularly thrilled with the way things are going. And, and uh, he's taking steps to distance himself uh, from Putin, and when and when you see the mass graves turn up, when you consider you know Buka and all those other incidents and the, the demolition of so many you know residences and apartment buildings, and you and you connect all the dots on that, what you have is a a, a Russia that's hard to be sympathetic with, uh, and and it's getting worse. Um, don't, don't you agree? I mean, Putin is losing confidence all over the world is he not it's look it looks like that uh, indeed on the meeting of the shanghai um, organization of cooperation uh, he uh, faced rather cool uh, reception not only by xi jinping but also by other leaders of the organization even leaders from the states that he likes to see as his vessels so the the state that he never um, basically thought seriously about like kyrgyzstan uh, or uh, tajikistan or some others so um indeed you know, he loses confidence of those who um at first um decided to wait and see what happens but uh, it's, uh, again, probably too early to say that Xi Jinping uh, turns his back uh, on Russia. Uh, he uh, probably would still uh, play this game um, with Russia, uh, trying to receive as uh, many uh, benefits from the cooperation, like resources or uh, uh, cheap goods that can come from Russia. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, he won't uh, uh, go all in in supporting Russia, at least in the nearest future. So um, he, Putin is losing confidence, that I agree. But uh, um, uh, I can't say that uh, uh, there is a dramatic change in the politics uh, and perception of the leaders uh, of so such countries as India, China, Brazil. Uh, South Africa or others that uh, are in uh, the same league with Russia, let's say. Thank you. Well, and, uh, uh, 
one, 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 one last point, probably. You asked about this sympathy that you can't feel towards the mass murder, the person who organized uh, the mass atrocities all over Ukraine. Um, I wish it is like it's easy like that, uh, but uh, probably in many situations, world leaders, uh, especially those who are uh, ruling their countries for um, almost decades, uh, they uh, um, choose to uh, formally they choose to close their eyes on such situations. Uh, Russian mass atrocities are maybe the most brutal in the modern history. But at the same time, there were other examples of brutal crimes committed against other peoples. Even Russians, they committed really brutal crimes in Syria. And look how it influenced the picture of Putin in the world. He was perceived rather as uh, um, the guy who uh, was able to stop uh, United States invasion in Syria, the guy who um, helped his friend to uh, win in this revolution, uh, our spring revolution in Syria. So uh, mass atrocities, atrocities committed in uh, Syria didn't lead to uh, the loss of uh, his uh, reputation in the world. And uh, he was still sympathized by many, including in China and in Chinese leadership and Chinese media. So um, while I agree with you that uh, from the normal person perspective, it's quite hard to sympathize Putin or any other civil or military commander in Russia. But from the geopolitical point of view, it's not such a, such a big problem for many leaders. Mm. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, um, I think we have to take into account the fact that, that Putin, like Hitler, uh, tries to secrete uh, what he's doing and deny the war crimes, deny the atrocities, uh, just like you know Hitler didn't talk much about the concentration camps. That was a big secret for years, and it was only after the Allies, uh, you know, um, took Germany uh, and the Russians, for for that matter, took uh, East Germany, uh, then then it came out what Hitler had been doing. So. I think we have to realize that for a lot of people in Russia, they don't know because, uh, because Putin suppresses the information. Uh, and then for the outside, he denies it. So you're left with a certain level of confusion about what he is doing. I remember early on in, in this invasion, there were virtually thousands of people, um, not limited to Project Expedite Justice, but some various NGOs who were investigating war crimes. Uh, who were in the country uh, investigating. Um, and it struck me that, gee whiz, isn't all the evidence on videotape anyway? Uh, can't we just prove that um, you know, by playing the tape? Can't we go to The Hague and the International Court of Justice and, and show them the tape? Um, is this kind of investigation necessary? And what is happening right now with the investigation of these war crimes? Because it seems to me that we find out about more war crimes every day. That's true. We really find out about more war crimes every day. Um, but uh, that's because uh, thousands and thousands of war crimes were committed in Ukraine during these first seven months of the conflict. Um, so um, what is going on is that Ukraine is doing its best in documenting war crimes, both on the side of the government and on the side of the non-governmental organization, civil society. Uh, we collect this information for several purposes. The first would be um, national or domestic prosecutions. And that's uh, the, the, biggest proportion, the biggest portion of uh, the facts that we have documented so far will go to the national courts. But also there are some uh, uh, evidence some um, uh, portions of information that will go to international criminal court or to the other national courts that can act uh, on the basis of the so-called universal jurisdiction principle which means that they can prosecute crime um, uh, that uh, was committed um, anywhere in the world 
So uh, some crimes would be definitely investigated either by foreign courts, foreign uh, investigatory authorities, or by the ICC. And also there is this idea that documenting helps to uh, create the historic record of what uh, is happening. And this historic record may be used on the later stages for this building process or some kind of transitional justice mechanism like trust um, commission or fact-finding commission or something like that. So there is also this reason why uh, documentation of crimes that are being committed uh, and that were committed in Ukraine matters so much. You know, uh, one of the other issues that has been examined lately is uh, in the investigation of what happened in this country on January 6th, a lot of people are involved. It was a very, you know, broad and deep conspiracy involving a lot of people. And, and when you have that, uh, this, and this is akin to a terrorism around the world, technology can help. Um, social networking analysis of telephone calls, text messages, um, any kind of communication which leaves, leaves a record uh, can be used to connect up uh, the individuals who were involved in the conspiracy. And I suggest, at least to me, uh, it would seem that the same kind of technology, the same kind of methodology would also apply um, to what Putin has done and is doing uh, in Ukraine. Um, yes, there are people with names out there. Yes, they communicate with each other. Yes, that communication is, is, is it's somewhere. It's, it's in a record somewhere. And if you can find it and get it together, and apply this uh, artificial intelligence, uh, social networking analysis, you can establish who was involved in the initiative to conduct war crimes uh, and atrocities. Is this happening? Yes, that is happening. Um, both, again, civil society and governmental uh, official, they are uh, having some successful stories uh, of identifying the perpetrators of searching crimes. There are uh, even um, finished uh, cases, cases with uh, judgments uh, in Ukrainian judicial system where um, prosecutors were able to identify and persuade, identify the perpetrators and persuade the courts uh, that those same perpetrators committed war crimes. So uh, there are successful stories for sure. But again, there are thousands and thousands of war crimes that were committed during this first seven months of the conflict and many more uh, will be uh, identified or uh, we we got to we will get to know about many more crimes in the nearest future that we can be sure about as well unfortunately so uh, it's hard to um, to build each and every of these thousands of cases that is why it will take quite some time years i would say um, to um, get, uh, to turn uh, each stone and to um, uh, to persecute perse prosecute uh, each and every crime. Mitro, are you, are you involved in that effort now? Will you be involved in the long term over those years and years of of investigation and prosecution? Uh, I've been working with uh, war crimes documentation since I would say 2015. And uh, um, the one of the organizations I uh, work with in Ukraine uh, was the first one who responded to um, the a new phase of Russian invasion into Ukraine. So since uh, February 24th, uh, we started documenting uh, war crimes and other international crimes that Russia uh, was committing in Ukraine. Um, so, yes, I am a part of this and I am taking part in documentation, in analysis of the uh, information gathered by documentators, but also I consult different state agencies like Security Service of Ukraine, which is heavily involved in investigation of different crimes in, committed in Ukraine. And also I consult um, uh, Office of the Prosecutor General uh, when it comes to a correct qualification of crimes, uh, legal argumentation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes, I am involved, and um, that is my uh, plan to 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 stay involved for the next couple of years. Good for you. 
Um, I'm sure there are many people who will come and help you. Uh, for example, Harold Coe, I don't know if you're familiar with that name. He was the dean of the Yale Law School until a few years ago, and he presented himself to the International Court in The Hague um, to organize the, uh, the war crimes uh, prosecutions that are taking place and will take place in The Hague. And I wanted to ask you about that. Um, so you mentioned before that uh, at the moment there are national prosecutions, national being Ukraine, Ukraine under the sovereignty of Ukraine or the court system, the laws of Ukraine, um, the Ukraine prosecutors and judges uh, and juries, if there are, um, will uh, will hear these cases and render decisions on whether there were war crimes and and uh, and uh, uh, you know and determine punishment. Um, are, they, are those cases happening now, uh, or is that something that won't happen uh, until the future? Domestic cases are happening now, and international cases will happen in future. As we know from the history of the International Criminal Court, for instance, it takes uh, indeed years for this court to um, investigate, uh, prosecute, and later come up with judgment. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, complicated uh, international crimes. So uh, I do not expect international court to rule on any issue uh, with regard to Ukrainian situation in the next few months or even years. But uh, at, at some point, we will definitely have ICC rulings, either arrest warrants or uh, judgments uh, themselves. Uh, do you, so, uh, go ahead. No, no. Please. Do you have to have the uh, the person um, within your physical control um, to do a um, uh, a domestic prosecution, or can you do it in, in absentia? In Ukraine, it's not necessary. Uh, we can do uh, the in absentia trials, so called. Uh, so that those are the trials when you do not have the physical presence of the person in the courtroom. But in the International Criminal Court, you do have, uh, you, you do need to have uh, the physical presence of the defendant in the court to proceed with the uh, prosecution. Uh, and how so, about the, the countries that will prosecute under universal jurisdiction? Um, does that assume that they have the body? It very much depends on uh, each and every country. So in uh, uh, every country, the legislation may and is uh, different. Um, but uh, uh, usually you do need to have uh, the perpetrator uh, on your territory to start the case, to even start the case, and uh, certainly to have uh, the court proceedings. So is, is the definition of war crime um, the same uh, domestically and uh, in The Hague and uh, in these universal jurisdiction jurisdictions? Uh, or does it differ? Uh, and how do you determine what what form would be most appropriate as far as one side or the other is concerned? I didn't want to dive into heavy legal discussions uh, since uh, <laughs> there are many issues with regards to Ukrainian national legislation, for instance, okay. um, concerning this uh, um, comparison between Ukrainian uh, legislation and uh, Rome statute, for instance, of the uh, of the International Criminal Court. But generally speaking, uh, the legislation on war crimes is very similar in uh, every jurisdiction, including international jurisdictions. You know, one thing we saw and we still see um, these uh, videos of uh, Russian bombs and missiles uh, blowing up residential buildings, shopping centers. You know, all kinds of you know non Non, non-war facilities within Ukraine, just destroying the country. Um, at the same time, we hear stories about uh, murder, uh, back of the head murders, and and ditches, and rape among you know of, of women and, and girls. Uh, really horrible, horrible things. So I, I can understand that shooting someone in the back of the head, somebody defenseless. Uh, doing a, a brutal uh, um, uh, exportation um, of that person 
uh, into Russia, into some camp in Russia that would, to me, would fall within a war crime. Um, you know, rape and assault of of women and young people and so forth. All that stuff. Uh, electrodes. We've seen pictures of electrodes and torture, uh, which the Russians apparently conducted in a number of places. Um, now that I see as war crime, but but is that different than blowing up residential buildings and apartment houses, or is is it the same? Is is blowing up a residential building an apartment house a war crime also? It uh, depends on the context, um, because in some um, situations, it's not against the international humanitarian law to cause some damage to residential buildings or, in other words, to civilian objects. Um, for instance, we can imagine the situation in which the civilian building uh, is being used uh, for military purposes. So for instance, uh, the uh, platoon of the enemy is deployed in the civilian object. This basically turns the civilian object into a military one and into a legal target for, for the other side of the conflict. So uh, blowing of the civilian or residential building um, may be a war crime if it's done on purpose uh, and if uh, the uh, perpetrators understood uh, that uh, this uh, object is civilian in nature and it is not being used in military uh, or for military purposes. So that would be then a war crime. Also, there is uh, this idea of proportionality. So even if uh, uh, there are some military objectives close to the civilian object, uh, but if those military objectives are not important enough, and at the same time in the civilian building, for instance, in the residential building, you have lots of civilians living uh, or hiding, you can't just target uh, the whole area and say that, you know, what uh, somewhere there were some soldiers or combatants, and that's why I covered the whole district with my uh, rockets, um, uh, with my shells. Uh, that would not be uh, what uh, IHL prescribes, and that would be a violation of the, of, uh, the laws and customs of war and the war crime, because it's uh, such a strike is unproportional. So it it depends, <laughs> if if I put it shortly. Hmm. Of course. Um, one one last thing, I really appreciate you spending the time with me. Um, is that Putin ha early on uh, made an implicit threat to use nuclear weapons, and he's repeated that threat more recently. We've also seen, um, uh, what shall I say, irresponsible conduct around Zaporizhia, um, the nuclear power plant there in the, in the south, um, and which could affect all of Europe if it, if it blows up. Um, how concerned are you that, that Putin uh, isn't bluffing, uh, that he may actually use uh, tactical weapons or other nuclear weapons in order to make his point and you know um, show that he's the boss, how 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 concerned are you, or not? I am concerned. I think that uh, it may happen. Um, Putin is the type of individual that can't accept losses as he sees it, and he can't recognize his own mistakes and uh, misdeeds. So um, because of that, uh, he's now facing what is called in chess Zugzwang, uh, so the situation in which uh, every his move uh, makes his position worse. And that's why he may be ready for a really radical decision like the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Maybe not against uh, the populated area, maybe against some unpopulated area just to um, send a signal, but uh, uh, I am concerned that this uh, might happen. Um, I can't say, I can't speak about the level of probability of such, uh, such, such a course, but definitely it's something that uh, United States and Europe should, and Ukraine, of course, should consider as a, as a possibility. At least. One last thing, Dimitro. Um... You are very uh, knowledgeable about these things, and I greatly appreciate that. 
what were you doing before the war started? Um, and why are you invested in these things now? What makes you so dedicated to helping Ukraine and helping the cause and in investigating war crimes for that matter? Um, before the war, uh, I uh, imagined my career as a, a career of academician. So I worked, uh, I uh, worked on the PhD uh, devoted to the international humanitarian law. And I uh, defended my PhD thesis in March 2014. And just a quick reminder that March 2014 was the, the, the month when uh, Russia started its operation in Crimea, started the occupation of Crimea. So uh, just in a few days, uh, my uh, dissertation, my PhD thesis, turned from purely theoretical to the very practical one. And that was the point when I decided that uh, it's a time that needs not only my academic um, commands and academic perception approaches, uh, but also some practical advices and uh, some actions. So that's how I um, and became invested in uh, documentation and in uh, consultation of different agencies on the uh, issues of uh, IHL and uh, war crimes. You know, you, you mentioned in 2014, uh, there was a movie about it. I think it was something about the, the Winter War or words to that effect. And it was, um, it was a stirring movie for sure. It was a stirring story. It was an amazing, heart-rending. Sorry. Yes, and, uh, I, I very much recommend to, to watch this movie, movie uh, to those who haven't done it yet. I, I, what I'm really getting at, though, is that th this is an, an even more stirring story now by far. And I would hope that there are people out there making more movies. Are they? Uh, we'll see. I hope so. Dimitro Kovel, um, a member of uh, Project Expedite Justice uh, and active in the investigation and uh, prosecution of war crimes in, in uh, Ukraine, who has been so helpful in answering my questions and in discussing the current state of affairs there. Thank you so much, Dimitro. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.